All right, thank you, Tamo, Damani. All right, so good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us on day two of GitOps Days. Um, I'm so delighted to be able to kick off the day again today with uh, this panel. Um, and so without op opining too long on that, let me just jump right over to our panelists and have them introduce themselves. And then I'll talk a little bit about the program for the next 25 minutes or so. So uh, first I'd like to have you Sneha introduce yourself. Please tell our, our listeners a bit about yourself. Sure thing. Well, thank you for having me here. Um, uh, my name is Sneha Rao. It's uh, spelled and pronounced the same way. Um, and I am a product lead uh, in a team called Core Infrastructure at Spotify. Um, my team is responsible for building and managing the service platform, as we call it, um, that powers thousands of features and millions of users and, and their experiences. So think of our team or my team as a microservice architecture uh, within Spotify. And while developer productivity is my team's top priority, we also counterbalance all of the uh, productivity measures with cost, rel reliability, and latency in mind. So we're constantly making those hard choices. And uh, infrastructure is, uh, is the key. And finding uh, ways to unpack that, unlock that, is, is how we do it. Um, and uh, I've been working in infrastructure as a service and IaaS for pretty much my whole career. I've worked at Comcast, uh, a NASA data center, um, and uh, New York Times. So ask me anything. I'm, I'm here. Wow. All yours. Excellent. Thank you. Um, all right. And Keith, can you please introduce yourself to our listeners? Sure. Thanks. And yeah, thanks for, for inviting me to participate in the panel, um, which should be good fun. Um, my name is Keith Morris. Um, I work for ThoughtWorks, so I'm a consultant. Um, I head up our uh, global kind of uh, cloud and infrastructure engineering um, community. Uh, I also wrote a book on infrastructure as code uh, published by O'Reilly. Um, I actually had two editions. The second edition came out um, just at the beginning of this year or end of last year. Um, so I've been, uh, I was interested in the evolution of infrastructure as code and, and how we do this stuff. Uh, I've been working with, with clients at, at, at ThoughtWorks for more than 10 years now and, and in other companies before that. Um, and it's always just kind of struck me how um, you know, the tools and technologies emerge and people try to come to grips with what, what, is, what are good ways to use these tools, what are effective ways to use them. Um, so certainly between the two editions of the book, which were about four and a half years apart, uh, a lot changed, a lot's changed in that time and a lot is still changing. So um, it's quite exciting to kind of talk um, with you about where things are going and, and may go. Excellent. So for those of you listening in, you might notice that both of our panelists come from an infrastructure background. They have a focus on, on optimizing the way that infrastructure is done to, to Sneha's point, um, enhance developer productivity. And so we do, you know, we're, this is GitOps days. So we spent some time yesterday talking about, you know, the GitOps and supporting the application developer directly in the way that they have their software development life cycle. But here we're also talking about how does GitOps play into the whole platform that supports those developer activities. So that infrastructure platform. So you did, like you said, you literally wrote the book on infrastructure as code keep. So can you maybe start out by giving us just a high level summary, first of all, of what are the what were the goals of infrastructure as code? Even if they didn't come at, they weren't clear at the very beginning, what are the things that infrastructure as code is deli delivering now? And, um, and what are kind of the key practices, if you will, in a nutshell? I think infrastructure as code kind of emerged from the ideas of thinking about how to make environments and infrastructure more consistent, um, where, you know, we used to, and, and often still do build and manage environments by hand, uh, you know, things get very messy. And especially when you think about that kind of path to production of going from development to testing, to staging, to production, or wh whatever you may have, um, differences between those environments, uh, you know, causes a lot of friction and, 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 makes things take a lot longer and the experience is very poor. So 
I think infrastructure as code for me um, in the early days was about how to how to smooth that out and and in order to do that it was about thinking about um, if we can use if we can define our infrastructure as code then that means we can we can take tools and practices and so on from software development and figure out well how can we use these for our infrastructure so things like testing and so on um, so I think that's always that's that's been kind of um, one of the drivers for me personally I've always kind of really focused in on um, like how do we take agile engineering practices in particular uh, to our infrastructure code so how can we we do things like test driven development for our infrastructure code can we use pipelines to deliver changes to our infrastructure as, as you know code um, and all that kind of good stuff and then design um, patterns how can we build as infrastructure projects get larger and larger how can we manage them more sensibly by drawing from things that we may have learned in, in areas like say microservices Awesome. Now, Sneha, you you are you called out developer productivity, developer enablement, right from the beginning. And I love what you just said, Keith, about environments being more consistent. I will share anecdotally with you all. My son, twenty six years old, he's a software engineer. Early in his career, he is at an organization that has not nailed that, and so I'm constantly getting these you know these texts from him that say, "Damn it." It runs on my colleague's machine, but it won't build on my machine. So no consistent environment. And it's just, it's brutal. It hits the developer to productivity and also morale. It is just so frustrating when you can't make progress um, because it just won't build and you don't have consistent environments. So tell me about how that, how you're realizing that for your developers. And I know a little bit about Spotify and the development practices there. And I think you really have achieved that optimizing the developer workflow through the work that you do. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, uh, I think uh, one way to describe our world is to just unpack the uh, the target audience that we think of uh, from an infrastructure team perspective. So let me uh, describe uh, feature developers and our segmentation that we have drawn in order to improve that experience. Um, there are uh, brand new engineers like uh, perhaps your son who has just started off in a workforce in a new company, in a new ecosystem, um, and uh, they find themselves not having a lot of tribal knowledge to work off of um, and having to build uh, and understand practices from, uh, from a few threads of uh, golden path tutorials and some knowledge tidbits that their teams uh, may share with them. What we've realized, the biggest hindrance for productivity in their case is that uphill battle of learning a new environment and a new ecosystem. So even if we have this environment created, the way Spotify develops uh, and deploys and runs their code is quite unique. And you, can, uh, you cannot expect somebody coming from the outside net new to understand that. So you know, uh, a way to sort of address that is, um, and I think Keith kind of uh, alluded to it, is building design patterns. Taking uh, uh, an engineer who is hired to build features to enable the business to focus on just that and not have to worry on infrastructure details, the nuts and bolts and the configurations and the specific panel adjustments that need to be made in order to make sure that their code works um, in the cloud as expected. That's some of the low variance work that my team, uh, core infrastructure is really well positioned to take. So we, we sort of create uh, what we call blue uh, blueprints uh, or architectural patterns to enable these common design patterns. Another persona is the more experienced engineer. They've been around, uh, Spotify is about 15 years old. They have years of experience on their uh, hand. They have tons of tribal knowledge at their exposure. They're used to working with infrastructure. They're used to having more controls. Well, what we find in their particular scenario uh, is that it's actually quite um, counterproductive to give them all those controls. Because when it comes to moving applications from one domain to another, uh, an example of that is moving uh, a language platform, like moving from one version of Java to another, or, or moving from Python uh, uh, language framework, or moving from like, a, uh, like an Oracle uh, database. These are migrations that are, uh, require a lot of work. 
And the more uh, susceptible or the older the application, the more dependencies that those applications have over time. So for them, the biggest hindrance is moving and shifting to stay in sync with the best practices that infrastructure teams create. For that particular persona, we have created a, a program called Fleet Management, where we take away all those operations and we manage them declaratively. We use infrastructure as code. We have a mechanism to manage configuration, and we manage all of that through declarative infrastructure that uh, uh, we've built over time. So now all of this sounds pretty complex. I, I shared a lot of detail, and I, I and I recognize that that you know sounds like all right, that worked for Spotify. How does that work here? Well. You know, I think the context matters and which is why I'm diving into the details here. Uh, I, I think it matters. And in our particular scenario, and I'm hoping that maybe this is helpful for those who are listening, is that we've created our own open uh, source development portal. It's called Backstage. And that is where we manage these workloads. We manage the tooling to support fleet management. We manage the patterns and the designs in one seamless interface that all developers share. So as we grow uh, and scale up the number of engineers in the enterprise, uh, we're 7,500 employees. Um, you know, we need to have a way to replicate what works uh, and deprecate what doesn't. And this seems to be working really well. Um, and it's an open source project, so everyone has access to it. Okay, excellent. Now, I'm hearing both of you talk about consistency, consistent operational practices, consistent development environments, and those types of things. Now, I work for Weaveworks, and we talk about GitOps. And that's exactly the theme that we talk about as well. We talk about the consistent operational practices. We talk about empowering the developer about not burdening them with, with certain details about having the platform team, or as you're calling it, the infrastructure team, codif codifying the best practices and those types of things. So is GitOps the new infrastructure's code? Is it infrastructure's code versus GitOps? Who wants to start? I'll, I'll talk about that. <laughs> right. Um, so I think it's interesting when I, you know, so I kind of see infrastructure as code and GitOps um, in the same way that I see like Agile, if you look at Agile as software development, um, you, there are kind of specific um, ways of doing Agile, specific kind of um, I don't know, methodologies. So think about Scrum, think about Kanban, think about, um, you know, some of these, these, these kind of things where, uh, you know, Scrum is not Agile, well, it is not the only way to do Agile, it's one of the ways you can do Agile, right? Um, and these different methodologies tend to focus on different areas um, and different aspects and different problems. So Scrum tends to be a little bit more on how to manage projects and so on versus say extreme programming, which is a little bit more on the kind of testing and, and um, developer practices. And so you can often com combine them, right? So with infrastructure as code, I kind of see, they're kind of different schools maybe, you could think of it that way, schools of thought on that. So GitOps is one and the one that's obviously going um, gangbusters or we wouldn't all be here <laughs> with so much, so much things that people have to say about it, you know, yesterday and today. Um, you also have, you could say, immutable infrastructure. Um, uh, people, uh, you know, still talk about uh, a fair bit. There's the stuff that the the likes of Pulumi um, and Amazon and and um, HashiCorp are are working on, where you're you're kind of using more programming languages to, to more dynamically either dynamically generate code as as with the CDK, or dynamically generate infrastructure as with the kind of Pulumi approach. Um, which I think are quite interesting. I think all of these kind of different approaches probably have different areas and different different strengths where you might bring them to bear. So so um, GitOps um, is obviously um, highly relevant in the the cloud native world and and you know with with um, systems like um, Kubernetes. And I do see people applying it um, or or variations of it, let's say, um, to, to to other types of infrastructure code as well, even outside of of um, cloud native infrastructure. Yeah, and so I'll admit that in the pre-show, in the chat we were having pre-show, um, Sneha talked a little bit about the practices that she uses at Spotify, which she didn't, she talked about a breadth of different things, including GitOps. So maybe Sneha, you can share some of those comments with our listeners now to give a perspective of 
the, the broad range of things that you do and how you see GitOps in relation to infrastructure as code at your organization. Um, absolutely. I um, <laughs> So one of the things I said before the pre-show is I don't, I don't necessarily see these as two separate pieces. I don't see uh, it as GitOps versus infrastructure as code. Um, I see these as a very complementary ecosystem. Um, in uh, what's worked uh, at Spotify, and I recognize that that's not necessarily true for every enterprise, but if at our scale and companies similar to our scale, like Shopify, Netflix, I do happen to talk to them all, uh, what we're finding is consistency in those frameworks uh, is very important. So GitOps uh, adoption is, uh, is, is, uh, is pretty mature. And so is the practice of writing infrastructure as code, managing your configuration, setting up declarative infra uh, pipelines, and managing through uh, all of that through a, a continuous integration and continuous deployment framework um, uh, for uh, uh, a consistent and high feature velocity outcome. Uh, to, so that the feedback loop of what works and what doesn't work, pulling back uh, from uh, and and ret, uh, you know re um, uh, re scoping uh, what uh, experiments and what bets are made, uh, and when you make new feature releases as an application team, uh, is uh, is very much dependent on the infrastructure and the foundation that it's built on. So if the foundation is not resilient to change and it cannot adapt to change by like a continuous feedback loop from CICD, uh, um, then it 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 all it's it's too brittle and then it just doesn't work. So the agility and the agile principles that Keith mentioned, I, I think it squarely applies to infrastructure as well. Uh, and it's something we 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 live and breathe by. All, all of the teams that uh, uh, I, I manage, we all have uh, um, agile as like a, a principle uh, uh, that we uh, that we work within. So uh, that's one more uh, framework for how projects come in and for how projects are delivered against. And another framework is GitOps, uh, and uh, um, IAC just happens to be one of the pieces of that framework. Um, at least that's the way, in my experience, that's how I've seen it. Okay, now you've both talked about declarative configuration. So declarative is, I think, very central to this. It's part of what gives us that repeatability that we were talking about. And behind that, of course, there's, there's automation. Now, one of the more interesting dialogues that we have around the GitOps is that we, we characterize the type of automation that is associated with GitOps as convergent automation. So we talk about these convergent loops, these control loops, and when we're applying it to Kubernetes, we've got controllers that are running in an infinite loop. And not all of infrastructure as code ascribes to this convergent, constantly you know, adapting way. Infrastructure as code, arguably, you could check in something into, let's say, Git repository, and it runs some script. And to some extent, that's definitely infrastructure as code. So. Can either of you or both of you maybe remark on that, that element that GitOps brings of, no, we actually insist that this is done in a convergent me mechanism. We know that things are always changing and we know that we're constantly adapting. Any comments on that, that element of GitOps, that convergent automation? Definitely talk about it. I, just want, I, don't, I don't want to kind of always jump in and <laughs> give yeah, go for it. it. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, yeah, I think it's um, so. Uh, in the first edition of the Infrastructure as Code book, um, I used the the phrase um, uh, configuration synchronization. I think I called it. I think Martin Fowler on his Blicky um, had, had an entry about that. Um, and so I think it's and it's so I think it's like I see kind of a couple different patterns for how people use infrastructure as code in order how how they synchronize. Um, one is kind of the, the I think as you, as you allude to, the, the old school way of just treating it like a script. So I've seen people using even like Chef and, and, and Puppet code to say, I'm going to edit the code and then I'm going to apply it when I need to make a change. Then I'm not going to apply it again until the next change that I need to make. And then I've, I've used the term, um, uh, what did I call it? There's that kind of synchronization gap or configure, you know, where the longer and, and apply, it, it, it's a kind of a, whether it's infrastructure as code 
or automated tests or those kind of things, the longer you go between running your automation, the more things are going to diverge and the more likely it is to break. And it, it causes this kind of thing of, of, of people get very afraid of their infrastructure as code tools because it's like, oh, we run it and it breaks all the time. And it's like, well, it's because you, you, you know, if you do the, the this continuously applying and reapplying it, then that, you know, that avoids that because if, if something creeps in to make a difference, either eliminates it and brings it back into, into sync or it tells you right away. Um, and obviously you need to have good mature monitoring and those kind of things to let you know. Um, so so I, I, I strongly advocate that approach. I think um, an alternative, if you think about the immutable infrastructure that I mentioned before, is kind of completely different, um, which is to say, we're not gonna change any an existing instance. We'll always build a new instance and then swap it out. Um, which is an approach. I don't see that getting as much traction, certainly not wi you know, as widely um, as, as other modes, but it's like, to me, I have to think about the kind of three different, I guess those are three different ways that you can apply infrastructure code. Yeah, interesting. So Sneha, you've been talking about, you, you have a number of different practices, GitOps only being one of the practices in infrastructure's code. Do you have like, where do you use this convergent automation and where does something like um, immutable infrastructure or just, you know, immutable infrastructure perhaps together with an imperative script, do you have certain use cases where one is, is working really well or you've started experimenting? Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, absolutely. Uh, we've, we've tried both. <laughs> Um, and uh, our learning from uh, uh, the immutable uh, form of operations is, uh, it goes back to a point I was making earlier, it's too brittle, it doesn't scale. Um, and so the convergent automation seems to be um, the direction we're heading in. I can't say that the verdict is out yet because this is a constantly shifting uh, um, uh, uh, world. Um, and there are a lot of dynamics at play that perhaps we haven't touched on, which is worth noting. Um, the, the concept of giving more control to uh, application developers versus pulling back controls uh, as it relates to infrastructure, where do you draw that line? And if you don't draw a very discreet line on, on where does application development start and end and where does infrastructure start and end, then do um, is that a healthy environment? Um, because cloud native op op uh, you know, uh, providers are providing solutions that are function based. Uh, they're moving towards serverless. So uh, to not be thinking about those uh, like the future, uh, which is very much current, it, it's kind of pigeonholing yourself to, uh, to just one set method. So you have to kind of, uh, think about the dynamics and which is why I'm, I, I don't have like, uh, oh yeah, this is the only way uh, sort of response to this question. Uh, but I'm, I'm just uh, opening up uh, the discussion to the fact that there, there's several factors to be considered as we decide define what the future is. Yeah, okay. And that future is, is a really great segue. I love that you brought up, you know, functions as a service as well. Um, uh, so excellent. Well, believe it or not, our time is already drawing to a close that feels like it was about two minutes ago that we started. Um, but in closing, I would love for each of you to tell us as a community, what do you need from GitOps? Where can we go from here? What, what, what's the most compelling thing today? And what, what are the biggest gaps? Um, who wants to go first? I'll go ahead if we keep our pattern. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, so I think for me, um, the 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 issue I often see. So at ThoughtWorks client you know, projects that I've 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 um, kind of come across uh, with our clients, um, a lot of times I think what 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 tends to be missing when people are talk about GitOps. First of all. A lot of people say they're using GitOps and they're they're not, particularly the the convergence thing that you're talking about. So they're saying, yep. oh, our infrastructure code is in in uh, Git is in Git, and we have branches for each of our environments, and we use pull requests to manage changes to them. So we're doing GitOps, but we they don't, you know, they still only kind of apply it, um, you know, when they're ready, right? Yeah. Um, and so that's that's one issue. Um, I think the other thing is in 
to, to, to go to that thing with the branches is how do we manage changes, uh, make changes that, across environments. So the main, so my understanding of GitOps, which is, is, is incomplete, I'll, I'll say, but is that it largely is focused on, uh, I've got an instance, I've got an environment, and I've got the code for that. And as you say, it's declarative and it's continuously synchronized and we're not kind of managing, you know, we're not doing anything uh, more interactive to, to, to make changes to, or to do, you know, kind of maintenance activities. Um, but then the question is, so when I want to make a change to infrastructure, let's assume that I want to put it in a test environment first and maybe progress it through different environments. How do we manage that? Um, and this is where um, I'm, I'm, I run across a lot of, of messiness um, because what tends to happen is people have essentially separate copies of, of, of code, separate projects for each of their environments. And that doesn't really help with that whole consistency thing we've talked about. You're essentially not really doing anything different than we did in the old days of building each environment by hand and then saying, I'm going to make the change here. And then once that's good, I'll make the same change here and hope I don't mess it up. Or remember the differences. Remember when you copy your code or merge your branch uh, from one to the other, uh, don't forget you have to change all the strings from dev to staging or else yeah. it'll, it'll blow up yeah. right? um, or, or, or whatever it is, right? And changing so, namespaces, that's one that bites me all the time, changing a namespace somewhere, yep. So I'm really keen that we have um, ways to manage changes, ways to, to, to manage our code, to think about code as a reusable thing the same way we think about our application, right? We don't have a separate um, project for our application code for each environment and then copy and paste changes between them or uh, even merge changes and branches between them. We build an artifact and then we promote it. Now, artifacts for infrastructure is is not really so much a thing. Um, I mean, I, I've certainly done it, and and I know lots of people who who, who do it. Um, but yeah, I think this is this is an area that, as an industry, whether it's GitOps or other approaches, I think we need to get better at because um, yeah, like I said, on, on projects that I've 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 been on with our, our ThoughtWorks clients, this is so common to run across people with these just kind of mess, you know, chaos <laughs> between yeah. their environment configurations. Yeah. Excellent. And Sneha, last word. <laughs> word. Um, no, not one word. Last <laughs> words, plural. Um, I think um, what I can leave uh, the uh, the panel with is some of the struggles that we uh, that we see, um, and uh, perhaps there are solutions that can be thought of by the hive minds uh, here. Um, Environment changes in the context of moving from one cloud to another mm. is, is something we constantly think about. Uh, we, um, uh, through acquisitions, we have uh, inherited um, uh, uh, companies and workloads that run in various different clouds. Um, so to create an environment where the uh, everything is decoupled that the code can come from an application developer the configurations can be managed through a seamless operations model and that the environment is is a plug and play conceptually that sounds great in reality it isn't it isn't as as seamless as that so multi-cloud operations um through frameworks like GitOps is something that uh, I, I think is fairly nascent uh, and uh, can uh, can improve. And then um, another area that uh, um, is, is f fairly foundational is moving between language frameworks. How does a company at, at, our, uh, at our scale uh, uh, adopt and stay relevant across the fleet? Uh, how, uh, um, you know, we haven't found a way to automate that function. And, but if we could, uh, it, it would be brilliant. Yeah. Um, so. yeah. Well, thank you both, because I feel like you just wrote our backlog for the next year or so. So I appreciate that feedback. Um, thank you both so much for joining us here today. Uh, I think this was just a phenomenal way to kick off the day. Um, there's lots more great talks coming, but once again, thank you for joining us and sharing your, your very real world perspectives with our audience.